is us finding more power than I'd ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Good morning. We are very thankful for your attendance this morning. We are blessed that you are here. We have some visitors with us. And we're very thankful for your ability to be with us this morning as we worship. We're going to sing the next, I believe, two songs. I can't remember right now. And then I believe Zach's got us in our opening prayer. Is that right, Zach? Okay. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know they'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs are sweet as praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved, anchored in Jehovah. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. In his love abiding, I shall not be moved. And in him confiding, I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall be moved singing I shall not be I shall not be moved I shall not be I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters I shall not be moved though all hell assail me I shall not be moved. Jesus will not fail me. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved singing. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall 
shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved. On the rock of ages, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved singing. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Would you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, Father, we thank you so much again for this day you have given us to come here this morning to uh, study another portion of your word, to fellowship with one another here this morning, to sing these songs of praise. Father, we ask you to please be with us this morning as we go through our worship service, that everything that is said and done may be pleasing according to your will. So please be with Ernie as he leads us in our singing. Please be with him and be with Jason as he presents the lesson and all the men who uh, help with the service this morning. As he, please be with us and ask you please be with the ones we mentioned our Pray list each time we meet, Father, the ones who are recently mourning a loss of loved ones. You please be with them and comfort them as only you can. That we can be there for those families best that we can, Father. Please be with the ones who are sick at this time. You please restore their health. Be your will, Father. We just ask you, please be with the men and women who are uh, fighting overseas or here in our country, fighting for our freedoms and for our safety. Ask please be with them and. If it be your will, they could return to their homes safely when they can. Please be with the leaders of our country and leaders through the world. Please be with them and help them to make uh, godly decisions and come to peaceful resolutions. Dear Father, again, we just ask you, please be with us and all that we do. Help us to look to you for guidance. You would strengthen us spiritually. Help us to overcome the many temptations that we face. And uh, again, Father, we just ask you, please go with us now. God guard direct us and forgive us for how many sins we commit. I see things in Jesus' name. Amen. After the singing of this next song, we'll be we'll have our scripture reading, and then Brother Jason will be bringing us in our lesson today. How shall the young secure their heart and guard their lives from sin? Thy word, the choicest rule, impart to keep the conscience clean. Son of heavenly light that guides us all the day and through the dangers of the night a lamp to lead our way. Page that holy book. 
dog shall guide our youth and well support our age and well support our age. Scripture reading today will be from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 33. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here this morning. It's great to see you on this cold spring morning. I'm just tired of saying it's cold. Ready for it to warm up. Well, it is uh, great to be together and open God's Word and reflect upon its truths for us. I appreciate the songs that Ernie led for us this morning. The song that had to do with I Shall Not Be Moved, which I always think of uh, the first psalm, the tree planted by the water, the righteous man, and... Uh, that last song that he led us in, How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts, what a great message that song has. As we think about this series of lessons that we're doing on why we do what we do or why we believe what we believe, why we practice the things that we do in the Lord's church, those two concepts are very important. Understanding Teaching the next generation is extremely important. How shall the young secure their hearts? It's not based on the teachings of men, but it's on the teachings of the word of God. The young shall secure their hearts. And it is extremely important once we come to an understanding of what God has said on any particular topic, especially those that are, are very important topics and very clear, then we should not be moved. Don't move away from that. And don't be ashamed to stand on the word of God and advocate for the clear, simple, plain truth of what God has said in his word. We used this passage a number of weeks ago when we started talking about these different topics of why we do what we do. And it's when Peter wrote to Christians who were going through intense persecution from a number of probably sources these Christians were under fire. Their, their faith was under attack. And he encourages them greatly in the third chapter by saying, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ, will be put to shame. For it is better, if, for it is better 
if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. While what all of what while Peter says there, all of that is, is very good for the, the Christians to hear. What I want us to reflect on and to think about is what he says in verse 15, right there in the middle. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defense. Some translations say to give an account. Just to tell people. To anyone who asks to give an account for the hope that is in you. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you, why do, you do what you do? If someone were to ask you those kinds of questions surrounding the different topics that we're looking at, could you tell them why you believe or why you do what you do? It's important that we need to talk about and reinforce what should be clear biblical truth to remind us what God has said in his word. And once we understand what God has said, as I said before, don't be moved. Stand on the truth of God's word. And most importantly, don't be ashamed. Do it, as Peter says, with gentleness and reverence. Don't be arrogant. Don't be condescending. Don't be, you know, gleefully judgmental of the wrongdoing of others. But as you do it, do it with gentleness and reverence, understanding where you came from and the sin that God has saved you from. The most important thing to understand is don't be ashamed. In the headlines this week, many of you may be familiar that the first black woman nominated to the highest court in our country could not answer what has to be the easiest question ever asked to a Supreme Court nominee in the history of Supreme Court nominee questions. Anybody see this? She was asked the question by one of the senators, can you define the word woman? Now you want to talk about an easy question. If those are the types of questions, then I could serve on the Supreme Court. I mean, pretty much anybody in here could serve on the Supreme Court. If those are the, the types of questions that vets the competency of a Supreme Court justice. And if you're familiar with what's going on in our society, you understand the relevance of this question. There are a lot of people who are debating what a woman is today. I did a little experiment before we started this morning. Just wanted to see. I asked one of the youngest among us, Brody, what is a woman? And he said, an older girl. And when I tried to press, he said, well, we haven't had that talk yet, so I didn't want to press any further. But in all reality... That is a better answer than what was given by this Supreme Court nominee. She simply said, no, I can't. Not in this context. And she said, I'm not a biologist. That is sad and incredible and borderline ridiculously humorous at the same time. Think about that. I'm not, you have to be a biologist to be able to tell what a woman is. That's where we are in our society, where people have skewed what are obvious, long-standing, understandable things. They have skewed it to such a degree that people can't even answer that simple question. How about an adult female human being? that has XX chromosomes, able to produce eggs, carry and give birth to other human beings. You could go on and on, and right? You could give those simple answers, but that doesn't fit what a lot of people are pushing today in our society. 
that men can be women and women can be men and vice versa and all these things. I mean, an archaeologist can dig up the bones of a 4,000-year-old person and they can determine based on the bones whether or not that person was a man or a woman. I mean, that's how deep the clear differences between men and women are. And we go to the, the Word of God and we read in the very beginning that God created male and female. And yet, <clears throat> there are people in positions like this making decisions that impact our entire country in real and significant ways, unable to answer that kind of question. Now, if you think about it, in our current series, we've been looking at the topic of why we do what we do. And the reason I bring this up is because of our topic this morning. If people can't understand or can't answer simple questions like that, how are you going to address perhaps even more bitterly contested issues or questions with people in our society? If you can't agree on basic biology, and that's an interesting thing. By the way, the Supreme Court nominee gave away a little bit there where when she said, I'm not a biologist, she's admitting that it's rooted in biology, the difference between men and women. But what people will say today in this debate, denying that you can tell what a woman is or how you can define what a woman is, they'll say it's a social construct. So what she should have said, if she wanted to be consistent with that line of thinking, was, I'm not a sociologist. Because in our world today, they want sociologists to define what a woman is rather than biology. We've looked at the, the biblical perspective on a number of topics, but when it comes to our, our topic this morning, male leadership in the church, it, it's one that, that it is important for us to understand. To understand what the Bible says regarding this practice to understand the bible's perspective its authoritative teaching and to stand on what it teaches so far we've looked at baptism and communion and a cappella singing and corporate worship what the bible has to say about those different topics and this morning we look at a topic that's that's really not unique to churches of christ and that is male leadership in the church. Historically speaking, nearly every church has been exclusively led by men. And this is one of those core teachings of the church and has been for some 2,000 years. So our question that we need to ask, and a lot of people are, are asking nowadays, is has the church's position for centuries somehow been flawed? Is this wrong? Should it be only led by men in terms of public leadership? Should women be able to preach or to serve as elders and deacons? Is this a teaching of scripture that is culturally connected to the first century? And is it permissible to change these sorts of things? You see, these are the kinds of questions that people are asking, debating, and turning to scripture to find the answer. And while we will consider what Scripture has to say regarding the topic, I want us to first understand, when you approach a topic like this and, and talk about male leadership in the church, oftentimes people who are opposed to that viewpoint will say, well, you're devaluing people who are not men or male. And that's not true at all. You see, leadership roles do not reflect intrinsic value. Simply because a person serves in a visible leadership role within a church does not mean whatsoever that that person is more important to God or more loved by God because of the position or role that they fulfill. They just simply have a different role, a different responsibility within the church. Just because 
I preach or somebody else preaches or, or somebody serves in a leadership capacity in a local church does not mean that they are of greater value in the eyes of God or more loved or more special than anybody else who is saved and cleansed by the blood of Jesus, by the gospel of Christ. You see, it doesn't reflect intrinsic value. It's important to remember what Paul said in Galatians chapter 3. Before this faith came, Paul writes, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified, justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as been, has have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to to the promise, talking about the comparison of, of, of where they came from under the law and now in faith in Jesus. Having been baptized into Christ, Paul says there is, there is no distinction in terms of value, intrinsic value. There's no greater love of God for the Jews more than the Greeks. God loves the Greeks just as much as he does. There's no difference in the intrinsic value of men and women. There's neither male nor female. When people try to make those distinctions about importance, you turn to the Bible and you see what the Bible has to say, the value that we all have. You see, when you start talking about leadership roles, somehow people want to say that that, that is, is, is a reflection upon importance in the eyes of God. And it's simply not the case. It does not reflect intrinsic value or importance in the eyes of God. I want you to think about Jesus and the role and, and the way that he elevated women. In, in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and following, Luke records this. Soon afterwards, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward. Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. There's a number of instances where Jesus has encounters with women. In fact, he, he, he basically, you could say, raises the level of respect and value of women in society and especially as servants in the kingdom of God. More than any other person, if you understand just simply the role and the value of women in ancient cultures, you know that that. Towards women, there, was, there were lots of discrimination and, and, and less value. In fact, women were viewed as possessions, property. And yet when Jesus comes along, things change what seems to be in a very radical way, breaking from societal norms or cultural norms. Jesus utilizes and taps into the resources of many women in the ministry that he was involved in. And the twelve were, were men. Many of his disciples were men, but many disciples as well were women who had valuable and, and very important roles. Think about the financial support that they gave to Jesus. Women of, of great uh, status even in, in their society gave support and helped. Jesus encountered many women throughout the Gospels. Women who helped evangelize, who helped bring people to faith, be aware of the kingdom of God. I think about the woman at the well in particular in John chapter 4. A woman who had a very sketchy background, a questionable past. 
And yet what does she do after this encounter with Jesus? She goes and she tells people, come and see this man. She introduces them to Jesus. And when we talk about later, I'll, I'll share with you a story that, that kind of emphasizes that point. But the impact that that one encounter has with Jesus led to perhaps multiplied hundreds, maybe even thousands of people becoming part of the kingdom of God. And that's powerful when you think about it. But Jesus raises the level of respect, raises the, the value of women in society, and the teachings of Jesus and his disciples, the apostles, reflect this very idea. It was read for us earlier from Ephesians chapter 5. In fact, that's going to be our passage this Wednesday night in the Bible study, that, that, that men ought to love their wives as their own body, as Christ loves the church. You see, Paul uses this analogy of husbands loving their wives and the importance of that to show the relationship that Jesus had with the church. And the, the ultimate price that he was willing to pay to purchase the church. There is no greater love. Jesus himself declares that. You laying down your life for another. That's, that's what Paul says how husbands ought to love your wives. And, and, and that, if that kind of love and that kind of respect and that kind of value is placed on another human being, well, that's not devaluing someone whatsoever. In fact, if you look at Paul and what he says about women, there are modern-day feminist theologians who have unfairly labeled Paul as some sort of misogynist or chauvinist. But before we look at what Paul says about the role of men and women in the church, in very clear uh, terms, notice what he says about these individuals that he worked with in the work of the gospel. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea. So you should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever matter she may require your help. For indeed, she has been a benefactor of many and of me also. He's writing to the church at Rome, sending his final greetings in this last chapter, and he opens that chapter as it's divided for us by commending this sister and talking about the value that she has brought to the kingdom to Paul himself. How many people has he been able to, to teach and to preach the gospel to because of the help of her? She was a benefactor to Paul in helping to support him in his work. He says in the very next two verses, Give my greetings to Prisca, Prisca and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. That's a pretty big statement. You have a, a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, who work in, in, in the effort of, of teaching others about Jesus and the gospel and Christianity. They're influential in helping um, Apollos to understand more clearly the way of the Lord. They're working alongside of Paul in Corinth because they're tent makers along with Paul. And Paul, in writing to the church at Rome, says, give my greetings to this husband, this wife, my brother and sister. Co-workers. He doesn't say, refer to Priscilla or Prisca or and Aquila in, in separate terms to say, the husband, he's my co-worker and his wife. No, they're both his co-workers. The work that they performed was crucial. And it's a pretty powerful statement when Paul says, not only do I thank them, but every single Gentile church. Their reach was far and wide. 
Then there's Philippians chapter 4. So then, in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. He's trying to help resolve whatever situation exists between Yodia and Syntyche, and he in the course of that, reveals that these women have been right there with me, contending for the gospel. I mean, just in those three passages, it doesn't sound like a, a feminine or a, a misogynist or, or some kind of uh, uh, chauvinist that is prejudiced towards women, not at all. But then some will look at the teachings of Paul, and they will say that his teaching on male leadership in the church is culturally limited to, to his time, his day, his time and place. Well, for Paul, if you look at what he says in his writings, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writing his letters to various churches and individuals, the leadership roles in the Lord's church are theologically rooted. They are not culturally rooted. And the examples that, that Paul will use to reinforce the leadership roles within the church goes beyond culture. In fact, Paul goes to the very beginning of time of human beings for the justification, the theological position that he will relate regarding leadership in the church. Look at what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Also the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing, with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as is proper for women who affirm that they worship God. A woman should learn in silence with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she is to be silent. For Adam was created first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. But she will be saved through childbearing if she continues in faith, love, and holiness with good sins. Now, there's a lot in this passage to unpack, and a lot of people have debated the, the significance and the meaning of these particular uh, passages or, or these sentences. We're, we're not going to do all of that this morning. We certainly don't have time. But, but I want you to notice but, that for Paul, what he says about the leadership position of men taking the leadership over women within the church is theologically rooted. It's not cultural. He goes back to Adam and Eve. What culture are they? He's the first man and woman. He roots this in theology, not culture. And so you can't say that this is something that can easily be changed or modified and moved away from. So if Paul says, I don't, I don't allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, that's something. You say, well, why, Paul? Well, he roots it in Scripture itself. And with this being scripture, honoring and acknowledging the teaching of scripture on this subject is important for us. It is clear. It is easily understandable. But what we need to emphasize is in leadership, visibility does not determine importance. Just as what we said earlier when it came to leadership roles, they don't determine intrinsic value. In leadership, just because someone leads in a visible way, that does not determine importance. I like to reflect on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when it comes to this. When Paul, in talking about the importance of every member in the body, says this, the eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. 
nor again the head to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, all the more, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary. And those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have a better presentation. What Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is no matter what the role in the body, no matter what function you perform, every person is important. Every role, every member is important. And we do a disservice, frankly, to people who serve in the church, be it male or female, when we view visible leadership positions within the church as more important than other things that are done in the church. To say, well, those are the most important things in the church. I think we do a disservice to what a lot of people are doing in the service of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, what is important is developing a servant heart. Go back and look at the passages that we looked at earlier from Paul, Romans chapter 16, Philippians chapter 4, and see the crucial role that some of these sisters that Paul mentions, what they meant to his ministry, and how highly he commends them and their importance. It's because they had a servant heart. They were sold out for Jesus. And they were working alongside of Paul in the work of the, uh, of the gospel of Christ and the kingdom of God. And every bit as crucial as anyone who might be, let's say, quote, visible on a Lord's Day, leading in a public worship assembly. You see, we tend to, to, to sort of think that way, that somebody who, who stands up and, and has a public leadership role in a public assembly, that somehow they're more important in the work of the local church than other people who may never be acknowledged for what they're doing. But that's simply not the case. What is crucial, what is vital, is that whether male or female, that we use our abilities to the glory of God. That we serve to God's glory. We don't do it for self-recognition. We don't do it to make a name for ourselves. We do it to glorify our God. I mentioned earlier about the importance of an individual and how that can impact untold hundreds, maybe even thousands of people. I usually use this story when it comes to evangelism, personal evangelism, and the power of, of teaching just one person. One person, that's it. But I want, you, I want you to think about it in terms of the value of the individual that, that is spoken about in this story. It's called The Power of One, and it's written by a preacher who passed away a few years ago. His name is Flavel Nichols. And the Nichols family was very well known in the South, when we lived down in Tennessee, uh, if you mentioned the Nichols family, it was sort of synonymous with gospel preachers in a number of, of southern states like Alabama and Texas and other places. But Flavel Nichols wrote this story, and he relates this true story, that after the war between the states, the Civil War, he says, there was a young woman that learned the truth and obeyed the gospel. Her sweetheart, J.H. Halbrook, was a Confederate soldier. He was captured by the Union Army, kept prisoner in Michigan until the war was over. He was given a ticket to Nashville, Tennessee, and $2.50 after the war. From there, he returned to Centerville and found what was left of his home and family. He found his girlfriend, and they were married. His wife studied the Bible with him, and he soon became a Christian. He thought the truth was so good and so simple that he began to teach and baptize many of his friends and neighbors. He began to preach, but recognized his need for more training. 
So he came to the original Mars Hill Bible School taught by T.B. Larimore. And upon completing his studies there, instead of going back to Tennessee, they moved farther south, coming into Walker, Marion, Fayette, and Lamar counties in Alabama. One of his many converts was Charlie Alexander Wheeler. His wife taught him to read from the Bible. Along with his wife, C.A. Wheeler obeyed the gospel and soon began preaching to others. C.A. Wheeler started more than 100 congregations and baptized more than 6,000 people. But wait, story's not ended. One of those 6,000 was my father, the late Gus Nichols. 12,000 were baptized under his preaching. Among those baptized by Gus Nichols, no one knows, nor can nor can know how many began to preach the glorious gospel of Christ. But I personally know several. I, Flavel Nichols, am one whom he baptized and whom he encouraged to preach the truth. And under my preaching, about 3,000 have been baptized. A few among them preached the gospel also. And here's the point. He writes, only eternity can reveal the total results of the conversion of that one girl nearly 150 years ago. The results are not yet all in. But this shows that 21,000 people have become Christian Christians through the single thread in the fabric of her influence. That's power. That's incredible. When you think about this one woman who helped to convert her husband with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and after that you're talking about tens of thousands of people who became Christians, and who knows how many more? You know, that puts it into perspective. When Jesus told that parable about the mustard seed, Remember, he says, the gospel, or the, the kingdom is like a, a mustard seed, one of the tiniest of all seeds. But when it grows, there are birds that come and make their nest in its branches. That right there is the power of the mustard seed, right? Women are not important. Not according to God. Not according to Paul. Not according to Jesus. But we want to say that there's some distinction between people who serve publicly or serve in leadership roles to say they are more value or more important to the kingdom of God than other people who are not as visible. And it's simply not true. It's ridiculous. And if you read scripture for any amount of time, you understand the value that God has placed on all of us. God has said in his word that, that there are leadership roles, there are responsibilities, there are distinctions among those who serve within the church. Those are God-ordained. And as, as I said earlier, once we understand them and acknowledge them, we must stand on them and not be moved and honor God in those things. But understand that no matter what God has said about those sorts of things, we don't devalue people and their role and their service in the body of Christ and the church. I want to take you back to Galatians chapter 3 as we close. Since faith has come, Paul says, we are no longer under a guardian, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. When we approach the throne of God, when we approach God in, in judgment, there will be no distinction. 
between Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. There will only be those who are in Christ, and those who are out of Christ. How do we get into Christ? Paul says, clearly, we are baptized into Christ. And when we are baptized into Christ, there is no greater value of some more than others in terms of their intrinsic value. God sheds his grace and love on all who obey the gospel. Maybe you need to do that this morning to publicly acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and put Christ on in baptism, as Paul mentions here, so that you can be a part of the body of Christ, where every member is important, no matter your role, and to understand the, the influence, the impact that you can have for the kingdom of God and the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ can be infinitely understood. The number of people that can be reached by the thread of your influence. What, what will that be? Well, if we take the attitude, well, we'll let the people who, who serve visibly on Sundays or Wednesdays, we'll, we'll sort of let them take care of all of that. How unfortunate if we take that approach, that view. To say that others who don't have a visible role or responsibility within the church have less value or importance or cannot contribute in real and meaningful ways to the glory of God. There are, there are many stories that disprove that. We read one of them this morning. If we can help you this morning either to obey the gospel or as a child of God, if you need the prayers of the congregation of support, encouragement, forgiveness, whatever it is, we're here as the body of Christ to support each other and to help each other. But if you need to obey the gospel this morning specifically, we're here to help you do that. Won't you let us know as we stand and as we sing? seated. 
As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, if you have not picked up the communion in the back when you came in, there is the fruit of the vine and there is also some of the bread. You can raise your hand and usher will bring that to you if you are in need of that. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. As we come around these emblems today and we think back on the love that was shown for each and every one of us, that the, in the garden there was a plan that through Christ that we could make that heavenly home when this life is over. As Jason's lesson kind of brought out, we got many members of this nation, this world that have been taught the gospel through unlikely sources some but as we are gathered around this table today we are here to remember that sacrifice that was given for each and every one of us that time on the cross as Jesus bore our sins as we prepare to take the bread let's Go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear God, our Father in Heaven, we come to you at this time thankful for the ability we have to, to be here to worship you. We pray, Father, as we prepare to partake of the bread which represents your Son's broken body, that we can do so with a pure heart. Remembering that sacrifice that was given and the love that was shown for each and every one of us.
We thank you, Father, for your willingness to send him to this earth and his willingness to come to this earth to suffer and to be that perfect sacrifice for us. It's through Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Dear God, we continue our thanks at this time, Father. Once again, thanking you for the love that was shown for each and every one of us. That your son was willing to come to this earth to be that perfect sacrifice. We pray that as we partake this fruit of the vine that we all examine ourselves to be sure we are in the right mind to, to partake of this fruit of the vine which represents your sh son shed blood, that blood that covers our sins in that book of life. We once again, Father, thank you for the love shown for each and every one of us. And it's through Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we have the opportunity to, to give, as the first century church did, so also do we, to, to spread the, the word throughout the world, throughout our area, to help those in need. <coughs> there is a box in the back. If you have not put anything in there and wish to, you can do that on your way out this morning. Let us go to our Heavenly Father for thanks for that. Dear God, our Father in Heaven, we come to you once again thankful for the ability we have to be in this building this morning to worship you. We pray, Father, as we prepare to give that we do so with a cheerful heart for we know you love a cheerful giver. We don't need to give grudgingly or feel it necessary. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you give us in this world, the country in which we live and the freedoms that we enjoy. Father, we thank you. And once again, Father, we thank you most of all for the love that was shown for each and every one of us that you sent your son to this earth and he willingly came to be that perfect sacrifice. It's through Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Just a few announcements before we dismiss. Uh, if you have not done so, I think there's a few bulletins left in the back. Go ahead and grab one of those. Got a little bit of information in there that we probably won't discuss up here today. Uh, those on our prayer list, we want to remember uh, Mandy Rogers, as she's been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. Jan Cisco. As her dementia is getting, or his dementia is getting increasingly worse. Uh, Jeff Bigler, um, longtime member of the staff at OVCYC, has Alzheimer's and it's progressive, break, progressing quickly. Sally Dixon, who's with us this morning, uh, she's recovering for her rotator, rotator cuff surgery. Also, Mackenzie Soprano had surgery on her knee after uh, basketball season ended. They finally went in and did that surgery on her knee. Um, was up last night feeling ill from the effects of the medicine, so they're not here this morning, but she is doing well and recovering. Uh, also, Charlie is home not feeling well this morning, so keep Charlie in your prayers as well. <coughs> Those sick and shut in, uh, Peggy Allman, Terry and Irene Boop, Don Gerber, Harry Miller. 
Uh, once again, our condolences go out to the family and friends of Jill Gates. Uh, it's Emily Knoll's cousin passed away and her funeral was this past week. Uh, we don't want to forget Sunday evening services at five o'clock. Uh, midweek Bible study at seven. And I do believe we actually have a men's meeting after services this evening. I think it's in the bulletin. Uh, Bible classes, we do start our new teacher rotation next Sunday. Uh, if you do pick up a bulletin on the back side of it, there are the names of those who are on the schedule to do so. Uh, if you don't remember which class you're supposed to teach and your name's on there, get with Ernie and he'll remind you. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? All right, if I, I do have a card. Um, it is kind of lengthy, so I will kind of hit the abbreviated form here, and I will hang it up in the back and let you guys read it at your leisure. It is uh, a thank you card for the con to the congregation for the thoughts and prayers as, as Rose Warden's illness and, and passing came. Uh, all those who fixed food, all those who served food, all those who prayed and, and supported the family throughout. Uh, once again, it is from Missy Joy. I will hang it up as it is a very heartfelt letter here, and I don't want to do it discredit by butchering it while I try to read it, so I will let you read that as it hangs in the back. All right, we'll have a closing prayer and then a closing song, and then we'll be dismissed to our classes. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we come to you at this time thankful for the ability we have to, to come to worship you. Father, we pray that everything we've said and done this morning has been found pleasing in your sight, as that is the reason we are here, to, to serve you, to worship you, not to just make ourselves feel better. We pray, Father, that you be with those who are on the sick list, if it be your will, that you return their health to them so they can come out and worship with us once again. We pray at this time, Father, that for those who are spiritually sick, that you can help us to be what they need us to be, to see the error in their ways. We pray, Father, that as we go out into the world, that your light shines, that others can see you in us. We thank you, Father, for the, the many things we take for granted each and every day. The beauty of your creation all around us, our families, and our friends. Father, we thank you. And once again, Father, we thank you most of all for the love that was shown for each and every one of us that your son was willing to come to this earth to be that perfect sacrifice. so that we may have that heavenly home when this life on earth is over. And it's through Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm to get out.